Good morning, everybody. As Father just said, I'm John Barron. I'm vice chair of the Fenwick board. I'm also from the class of 1976, and I happen to be the father of two friars. Now, if that's not enough connections to Fenwick, I'm also proud to be the older brother of Bishop Robert Barron, who is this year's recipient of the Lumen Tranquillum Award. I'd like to take you back to the fall of 1973. My mom, who's sitting in the front row here, sent my brother and myself off on a chartered bus from Western Springs. It was then the beginning of my brother's freshman year at Fenwick. My classmate, Mr. Quinn, was on that bus, believe it or not. So after our arduous 45-minute journey to Fenwick, um, uh, we arrived, and that arrival was also in many ways really the beginning, I think, of my brother's spiritual awakening. I'm sure he'll talk about that in a minute. The journey that began here for him has resulted in a very astonishing career. Bishop Barron, of course, was a longtime priest of the Archdiocese of Chicago. He served for a long time on the faculty and then as rector of Mundelein Seminary. And then in 2015, he was named an auxiliary bishop of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. He's perhaps best known as the founder of Word on Fire, a global digital ministry which serves as the avenue for his compelling preaching and evangelization. In 2011, Bishop Barron released the groundbreaking Catholicism series which, as you know, is a 10-part video DVD showcase of the truth, beauty, and goodness of the Catholic faith. It has been viewed by millions around the world and is widely used in parishes and classrooms, including some of those here at Fenwick. Bishop Barron's focus has always been on evangelization, and by any measure, he's been phenomenally successful. He's the second most followed Catholic leader in the world on social media, behind only the Pope. His sermons are heard more times each week than by any priest in the English-speaking world. Each year, Bishop Barron's digital platforms reach over 25 million unique people. He has 1.7 million followers on Facebook, about 128,000 Twitter followers, and his YouTube videos have been viewed more than 33 million times. I could go on, and I could go on, but I think you get it. Um, students, ladies and gentlemen here, I am happy and very proud to introduce to you the winner of this year's Lumen Tranquillum Award, Bishop Robert Barron. Wow, that's terrific. Thank you very much, everybody, and good morning. Yeah. <laughs> I'm number two after the Pope, but I'm coming after him. <laughs> Listen, I am really thrilled to be here. My brother mentioned that uh, they wanted to give me this award. I, I jumped at the opportunity. I, I wanted to come back uh, to Fenwick to see the place. Delighted to see all of you. Father, thank you for this uh, tremendous honor. Thanks to the whole board of trustees. It means really the world to me. It's a very deep honor. But the greatest joy, and I really mean this, is to see all of you, to see the students here, and to sense firsthand the obvious spirit that animates this place, which is terrific. Hey, listen, uh, you've heard a little bit about this already, but it's, it's no exaggeration to say that my whole life changed. The whole direction for my life was set in this building in the spring of 1974, when I was a freshman. So my memory is that we were coming in from either gym class or some kind of you know, recess period outside. It was a nice spring day. It was a bunch of uh, sweaty guys, it was all guys in those days, coming into religion class in the afternoon. And it was taught by a, at that time, young friar called Father Thomas Paulson, whom I met, by the way, a few years ago. He's in St. Louis now, I think. Um, but he was teaching the you know, ordinary freshman religion class. And he laid out for us that day one of St. Thomas Aquinas' famous arguments for the existence of God. 
Now, mind you, I was a Catholic kid going to Mass on Sunday. My dear mother, who's here, you know, took us uh, every week, of course, to Sunday Mass. I didn't disbelieve in God. But I had never heard the case for God made in such a persuasive way. It never occurred to me that you could think about God in such a compelling and serious way. And it lit a sort of fire in my mind. Now, as I walked out that classroom that day in the spring of 1974, I didn't say, oh, I'm becoming a priest and someday I'll be a bishop and I'll be an evangelist. No, no, if you had asked me as I walked out of that classroom, what do you want to be when you, you know, grow up? I probably would have said, shortstop for the Cubs. Are you Sox fans here? What are you guys? <laughs> of course, of course, you, you all have recent memories of the world champion Chicago Cubs, don't you? <laughs> Try rooting for 50 years for the Cubs, in my case. And then the year I'm sent to Los Angeles, they win the World Series. That was my experience. But when I was 14, oh, you know, by the way, could, can I have the freshman stand? Let me see the freshman here. There you are, you're all up there, okay. No, good, thank you. It's when I was your age, at your stage of life, right here at Fenwick, that everything changed for me. So you can sit down, thanks. <laughs> so when I walked out of the classroom, I didn't say, boy, I know what my whole life's about. But in fact, that lecture that afternoon planted a seed. I went home, I remember, and um, anyone, by the way, from Western Springs here? Any Western Springs people? All right. It still stands, the Thomas Ford Memorial Library. Do you know what that is? It's the Western Springs, you know, Village Library. I got on my 10-speed bike, I'm 14, and I, I drove up to uh, the Thomas Ford Library. And I went looking for a book on Thomas Aquinas. I, I knew almost nothing about this figure except that I was fascinated by him. And I found this series of books called The Great Books, edited by Mortimer Adler. And there were two big volumes on Thomas Aquinas. So I, I grabbed one of them that had the arguments for God's existence. And I remember I, I took it down and I, I tucked it under my shirt. And then I, I rode home on my bike. Well, anyone who has read any of St. Thomas Aquinas knows he's famously dense and difficult and complicated, right? So imagine you're 14 and, and with no further instruction, really, I'm trying to make my way through this book. And it was strange and difficult and puzzling, but I wonder if some of you guys, I met some of the theater folks early, when you first read Shakespeare, in fact, I first came across Shakespeare here. We read uh, Romeo and Juliet when I was a, a freshman. And you know that experience of what is this all about, this text? I, I barely understand it, yet that sense of how wonderful it is that such a thing should exist. Do you know what I mean? Or when the science people, when you read Einstein for the first time and you barely understand it, but it lights a fire in your mind. That's what it was like for me when I was 14. And I'm reading this, this rich and dense and complicated text, but it was feeding this hunger in me. Now, it was the seed that eventually grew into the vine, you might say, of the priesthood. And then my whole life, no kidding, has been determined very much from that first association with Thomas Aquinas. Almost all of my major academic work, my master's in philosophy, my license in theology, my doctorate in theology, I wrote on Thomas. Almost every book I've written has been either focused on him or containing large reference to him. I did my doctoral studies in Paris largely because, and it was Cardinal Joseph Bernardine who sent me for studies, and he, he said, where do you want to go? And I said, I want to go to Paris. And he said, why Paris? And I said, because it's Thomas Aquinas' city. Thomas Aquinas has followed me all through my life and in many ways determined the path that I've walked. It all began on that spring day at Fenwick High School. Then in 2015, when I became a bishop, bishops have to choose a motto, right, that we put on this, you know, coat of arms. You have to have a little saying. Well, I knew exactly what I wanted. I chose a motto from St. Thomas. The Latin is non nisi te domine. Any Latin students here? 
<laughs> it's a little, yes, yeah, good. I, I began my Latin studies here with the great Father Wren. You guys don't remember him, but maybe Father remembers him. Legendary Latin teacher. Non nisi te domine is a little bit tricky in Latin, but it means nothing except you, Lord. And here's the story behind it. So St. Thomas, the end of his life, is working on the last part of the Summa Theologiae, his great masterpiece of theology. And he's, he's unsure of whether he's done justice to the great theme of the Eucharist. So he dramatically puts, places the text at the foot of the cross, as though asking for judgment. And the story has it that a voice came from the cross, and of course Jesus spoke Latin to Thomas Aquinas, and he said, Bene scripsisti de me, Thomas. Well have you written of me, Thomas. What would you have as a reward? Now, can I just suggest to everybody in this room, especially the students, but everybody, that's a very interesting little spiritual exercise, is to imagine the Lord Jesus Christ standing in front of you right now and asking, what do you want? What do you want? I'll give it to you. Whatever you ask for, I'll give it to you. What would you say? Now, most of us sinners would say some version of, and Thomas Aquinas knew this, he said, the four great substitutes for God are wealth, pleasure, honor, and power. And think about it. Go through history. Look around you. That's what people tend to seek. Some version of those four things. Oh, I'm not happy, but if I had enough wealth, I'd be happy. Oh, I, I know I'm not happy, but it's because I don't have enough pleasure in my life. I'm not happy because I don't have enough power in my life. I don't have enough honor and fame in my life. Every song you listen to, practically every movie you watch, practically every commercial you listen to, it's everywhere in the ambient culture trying to convince us that one of those four things will make us happy. Wealth will make you wealthy. It will not make you happy. Honor will make you honored. It will not make you happy. Power will make you powerful. It will not make you happy. Why? Because the human soul, everybody, is wired for God. See, and, and we know it, don't we, precisely when we experience these good things but we don't feel satisfied. No matter how much wealth you acquire, it's not enough, is it? It doesn't satisfy the aching of the heart. No matter how much they honor you, it doesn't quell that deep hunger in you. No matter how much power you might wield, you're still left wanting more. Why? Because you're wired for God. You're wired for God. St. Augustine said it, didn't he? Lord, you made us for yourself, and therefore our heart is restless till it rests in you. Well, who is God? Who is God? God is love, right? Now, now, there is your formula. And if, forget everything I've said today, but remember this, I'll be happy. If, if 50 years from now you say, you know, that old bishop said something I've never forgotten. Remember this part of it. If you want to be happy, order your life toward love. Make love, which is what God is, the center of your life. And when you do that, listen, you'll know what to do with wealth when you acquire it. The wealth won't turn on you. You won't become addicted to it. It won't destroy you. You'll know what to do with it. If you give your life to love, you'll know what to do with honor when it comes to you. If you give your life to love, you'll know what to do with the power that you might acquire. You know, some of you will become probably very wealthy in the course of your life. Terrific. Nothing wrong with that. Some of you might wield someday great power in the world of business or finance or politics. Good. Nothing world wrong with that. Some of you will be greatly honored. Good. 
Thomas Aquinas said, honor is the flag of virtue. Nothing wrong with honor. But if and only if you have given your life radically over to love, to the love that God is, then you'll find joy. So, I mean, throw away, if you want, all the self-help books. Throw away Oprah's latest book. I mean, I mean that seriously. You want to know how to be happy. It's in that little formula of what St. Thomas Aquinas said to Christ. Non nisi te domine. I won't have wealth. I know you can give me all the wealth I'd ever want. I don't want that. I know you could give me all the power in the world, but I don't want that. I know you can make me the most famous person on the planet, but I don't want that. Non nisi te domine. I want nothing except you, Lord. That's what a saint sounds like. That's the saint that I discovered in the spring of 1974, right here, and that set me on a path that I've been walking, no kidding, till this very day. Let me give you the technical theological term for what happened to me that day. It's called grace. What's grace but an unmerited gift, right? It's an unmerited gift. Did I deserve what happened to me that day here at Fenwick High School? Uh -uh. Did I anticipate it? Did I expect it? No way. As I came on that, <laughs> that difficult bus trip my brother was talking about to get to Fenwick that day, did I have the slightest inkling that my whole life was going to change? No way. It came as a grace, an unmerited gift. Here's the whole of life, everybody, from the Catholic perspective. When grace comes, cooperate with it. You know what I'm saying? When grace comes, and, and, and we can't, grace comes unbidden. Grace comes in the most unexpected way. But when it comes, cooperate with it. Get on board with it. Ride, ride it. And that's my advice, if you want, for you today. Because it happened to me here. And I don't know if it will happen to you in the same way, probably not, but something like it might. Be attentive. Keep your ears and your eyes and your hearts open to grace. And when grace comes, get on board with it. And remember, you want to be happy. Give the same answer to Christ that Thomas Aquinas did. Non nisi te domine. I'll have nothing, Lord, except you. God bless you, everybody. Thanks again.